Our guest has arrived. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Good to be here. Hey, Khan. Hello. Yeah, guys, is it just me or do I kind of look like I'm on like Wayne's World right now? <laughs> a little bit. Well, I, <laughs> like, I think I'm at an angle, like, right? Yeah, yeah, I just need like, like, like greasy black hair, just like <laughs> kind of falling down. <laughs> all right, guys. <laughs> here we go. Well, now that we're all here, why don't we start off? Uh, I want to welcome everybody to Whiskey Wednesday Live. So this is an online uh, chat that brand stewards from around the world for Uncle Nearest are starting to do every Wednesday. Um, our jobs have changed very rapidly, uh, as I imagine many of you out there on the internet uh, have also had their jobs changed. And so we're uh, having conversations with some of our favorite brands and people who work uh, in the whiskey industry. Um, my name is Matt Carlson. I'm the brand steward for Los Angeles. Um, I'm drinking a little bit of our guest whiskey, the peated bourbon from Kings County. And if the rest of the Uncle Nearest brand stewards want to introduce themselves, and then we'll start our conversation with Colin. Hi, I'm Cassidy. Oh, oh Jesse will start. I am. The same <laughs> Listen, one at a time, guys, one at a time. <laughs> I'm Chastity from Chicago. Uh, and drinking Kings County, I think it's the Kentucky, the straight bourbon whiskey, and it's really delicious. I'm enjoying it. Uh, I'm Ian. I'm Ian in here, also in Chicago. Uh, tonight, I am enjoying the straight bourbon whiskey as well, and it is truly delicious. Great. Good. Uh, I'm Matt Neal. I'm from um, uh, the UK, and um, today I'm drinking the barrel strength which is a lot of flavor <laughs> brilliant <laughs> it's remarkably popular in the uk the barrel strength. yeah it's it's incredible <laughs> i don't know why it does so well there <laughs> it's because um, it's really really strong yeah. and good in cold weather <laughs> yeah, of course, of course. god I'm, I'm gonna have to have whiskey fomo for this in, in, entire 45 minutes because Colin, I, I, could, I couldn't get any of your whiskey here in Kentucky. There was yes. only, uh, there right. was, there was one, there's one spot that, uh, that sells, it sells really boutique bottles uh, and, and they sell stuff that, that we have this strange law in Kentucky where even if you're not distributed here, you can still buy bottles, register them and sell them. Uh, we're the, one of the only mm -hmm. states I think that does that. And, um, huh. and so there's one place that has Kings County uh, it's called Haymarket Whiskey Bar, but they are closed down right now. So yes, yes, I could have. Uh, I, yeah, they have a particularly good bottle, actually. <laughs> if you were uh, put that in there, rub it in even more. I'm on whiskey FOMO right now, but I remember uh, that I, barrel very specifically. So uh, yeah. Um, oh man, one day, one day, I will, I will go get yeah. some. Um, but my, my name is Richie Michaels. I'm the uh, national uh, ambassador for the U.S. And I am sipping on something else delicious. <laughs> <laughs> Our beautiful Uncle Nearest 1856. You cannot go wrong. Tennessee's finest ever whiskey. I think that's a great way for us to introduce uh, this week. So the San Francisco World Spirits announced their results recently. Um, we're very pleased that both 1856 and 1884 received gold medals, uh, but our uh, 1820, which is our single barrel barrel proof, received a double gold, which is uh, kind of the highest honor, and which we're thrilled about. But Colin, I have to say, we're a little jealous because two of your whiskeys got double gold, if I, if I'm correct, uh, the Empire Rye and then also the Bald and Bond Bourbon, right? So yeah. just want to say congratulations uh, to everybody around. Well done, buddy. Yeah, well done. Um, and for people who don't know Kings County, I know you don't have distribution in every state in the United States, and I feel like everybody should know your whiskey because it's one of my favorites. Um, I'll start with a question, but I thought if you could introduce yourself a little bit and tell us a little bit about Kings County before I ask my question. Sure, and I'm going to go ahead and join nice. everybody. <laughs> hey, what a guy. What a guy. Oh, I actually well got to Class visit. Act. Nice. I got to visit the distillery um, in the fall, or at least the, the farm that is to become the distillery, um, which is a pretty cool experience. I went with some distillers and um, kind of made a day of going to that and George Dickel. And um, it's a really uh, uh, huge project and a really great project. And so um, to be able to get there before most people had seen it, I consider to be kind of very lucky. Colin, so. did you did you reveal your celebrity status when you got to the uh, distillery, or did you 
go undercover. I did because I came with with a bunch of other distillers. So it was it was sort of understood that we were. I, don't, I mean, not VIP is not the right word, but we were. We were <laughs> no right VIP. Right. Sure <laughs> we're no probably visitors. the right word. Well, and I feel like we should say too. Uh, you do have a connection with Tennessee whiskey, even if you're from Kentucky. Uh, Nicole Austin, who who works at George Dickel, is uh, yeah. familiar to you, I think. So. Nicole was our um, head blender at Kings County almost wow. from day one. I mean, she came to us and said, this is what I want to do with my life. I want to make whiskey. You guys are making whiskey. Let me get in on this. And um, to her credit, she really built our blending program. And, a, and not a lot of craft distillers do a lot of, put a lot of focus on blending. They sort of figure once it passes a certain age threshold, it's good to go. Um, but Nicole was really, um, <clears throat> exacting about blending and um, then moved to Tullamore Dew for a couple of years and now is the mm. head distiller at um, George Dickel Cascade Hollow Distillery which is I want to say about 15 minutes away from the Uncle Nearest distillery. It's really close so, yeah yeah. Was she on the tour with you at Uncle Nearest? No uh, no but she did give us a very deep inside the George Dickel like <laughs> like climb up any ladder that you want to climb up um, Very cool <laughs> access, which as a distiller is pretty fun. Um, yeah. So, but did, I'm, she, I'm, did she give you a did she give you a bung knocker and a thief? What, did it, did it go that far? <laughs> we didn't we didn't go into any barrels, but I did see a lot of like white dog like lab sample distillates. So I know they're working on a few things over there that. Um, uh, you know, I think we drank straight from the still too. By the way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so it's, 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 Always fun when that happens. Shout out to Nicole. She's a good friend of mine. So, Nicole, I'm, I'm, I'll make sure she watches this after we put it up online so we can all say, hi, yeah. Nicole. Hi, Nicole. <laughs> <laughs> She's awesome. So, Colin, you're both the founder and distiller at Kings County and author of a few books, right? Yeah. Um, I met Colin. God, I went to the distillery in New York maybe four or five years ago. Mm -hmm. And then had the pleasure of bringing in uh, most of your whiskey to the bar that I worked at. I think um, distribution was just happening in California. And I didn't realize it at the time, but the Bald and Bond had just come out. And I think my bar bought half the allocation for the state because <laughs> right. um, they were 375s and I really liked it. Um, so we're going to, there's a couple questions uh, from the different stewards about how the brand started, but I wanted to start right off by by talking to you about current events and how they've been sure. affecting the distillery, uh, especially since if Kings County, if we haven't mentioned already, is the county that Brooklyn is in. So mm -hmm. the distillery is in New York City. And as we all know, that is a hot spot currently. Um, and I just wanted to talk to you about how that's affected production and how I think you've, you've switched and adapted a little bit to production of something yeah. else as well. So uh, yeah, we uh, kind of early on, we're sort of joking about how we should get into the hand sanitizer business because you know if this thing gets worse and <laughs> but but yet thinking it would be in sort of poor taste because because it hadn't gotten very bad yet and then when things did get bad it was like oh no actually this is something that we should maybe do or we can do and so <clears throat> two of our distillers charlie and roxy really looked into the recipe and as it turns out, the, it's fairly simple to mix up if you can get hydrogen peroxide and glycerin. And um, I mean, as a whiskey distillery, we're not all that well set up to make high proof spirit, which is required, but um, we kind of tuned our, our stills slightly differently. And so now we're producing like 84% alcohol off the stills, which is a lot higher than we usually do. Um, and so we've been making it available at the distillery for pickup and delivery for any donation that people want to give of a dollar or more and then it's our hope that people throw in some whiskey while they're at it and people have been I would say quite generous in doing so um, and it's a way to you know give back to our immediate community and to be productive and to do something that makes people feel safer and to kind of stay in business I think it's a really challenging time for everybody in our industry and so um, as distillers if we can step up and and just be in business and maybe even not that we're gonna change the game but i would say that um i have seen some of the larger distillers step into the sanitizer business after mm -hmm. seeing some of the smaller distillers do it so 
um, even if that's all we ever do is inspire some of the players that can really change the game to, to jump in. <clears throat> I think that's worth, worth it alone. But, um, you know, we've had to move from being a completely on-site visitor serving business with tours and bar and a bar and, and flights of whiskey to being an entirely virtual business. And, um, you know, that's, that's not without a lot of, uh, complication and, hard work from a lot of people. And so that's what's been going on, yeah. How is the hand sanitizer available? Are people ordering it online or is it- So you can, the distillery? you can order it online in New York State as of right now. And we're soon to have enough inventory that we can ship to other states. So I would say if you check back to our website within two, three days, we'll be able to ship nationwide again. We, we launched nationwide and then within four hours we were gone. So demand's been really high. high. Wow. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So, and, you know, in, in addition to the demand that comes in off our website, it's, it's people, you know, hospitals, nursing homes, clinics, not necessarily frontline hospitals, but places that are in medical need who are asking for it. And we just, we, there's no way we could produce, I mean, we're a tiny distillery in the scheme of things. So, um, so it's just been kind of, uh, 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 an eye opener in terms of all the the need that's out there for this stuff, um, but to be able to service that need in some very small way has been uh, great and has helped everybody feel very much on the same page about um, about what we're doing right now. Very cool. All right, Chastity, I feel like you have the next question. If you want to ask. Oh one. well, Colin, I like to know. We all have a great whiskey story um, about when we first fell in love with whiskey so i'd like to know when did you first fall in love with whiskey and what were you drinking right um well my first, <laughs> my first... <laughs> you don't have to tell us how old you were or anything like that right right, right. <laughs> well so i grew up in kentucky and i grew up in eastern kentucky um which is very different from say bluegrass horse racing bourbon kentucky it's really more the moonshine coal mining um okay. appalachian part of kentucky oh, was, I, i've been there i can vouch for that <laughs> yes it, yes it, 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 you're not in the city anymore okay, okay. <laughs> it's a little a little bit of a different vibe um but but as a dry county it was actually um to get alcohol you would have to go to a bootlegger and so there were any number of bootleggers who were still operational when i was in high school this was in the mid 90s um and so Mag Bailey was one of the great bootleggers of Harlem, Kentucky. Uh, she lived to be about 100 years old uh, and bootlegged for 80 of those years. I mean, it's just crazy. It was, wow. that, that, um, um, so very different economy, culture around alcohol. Um, uh, but really the first sort of uh, experience that I found memorable was I had a high school friend who was really into Elijah Craig. And it's because it was so hard to get uh, alcohol, we drive to Richmond and then just like drink a whole bottle because it, so, <laughs> it was so hard to get. You might as well just, you know, oh, wow. just, just go for it, it. Just, just yeah. get through it. And so, um, uh, but it, in his mind, that was the like, finest whiskey available. So I always kind of had that on my um, radar. But after moving to New York, it was really moonshine that got me interested in distilling. And so I would travel back to Kentucky and go to, Mag was not around back then, back by the time I had sort of become an adult, but um, there still were bootleggers. And so I would bring this Kentucky moonshine back to Brooklyn and share it with people. And that really was how I got interested in becoming a distiller myself. And it was to kind of out of curiosity and recognizing that this was sort of <laughs> at least the cultural heritage that people in New York thought that was my cultural heritage. Okay. whether or not it actually was um, <laughs> that maybe I should get into uh, bourbon and, and maybe start to make some moonshine. So I got a little still off the internet and started home distilling uh, in wow. like 2007. It's and then cool. knowing that that is fairly illegal. Um, <laughs> yeah. That part, that part. <laughs> your, 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 your secret is safe with us and society, <laughs> Colin. Um, <laughs> got, 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 uh, looked into what would take to go legitimate and, you know, how do you, 
how do you become a legitimate distiller from, from being a moonshiner, so to speak? And New York State had just passed some laws that made it actually more uh, accessible to become a distiller, less expensive. And so put a license in to become what became the first legal craft distillery in New York City mm -hmm. um, focused on whiskey. And so we started with moonshine, like an unaged whiskey. And then as time has gone on, we've added a bunch of aged whiskeys. And so we came out with a two-year bourbon and then a four-year bourbon, a bottle and bond. And now I think if there's any way to perceive like who, who is Kings County relative to, um, you know, sort of other craft players, we kind of exist between all these different whiskey distilling cultures. And so that allows us to kind of borrow from them, even though I, as a sort of Appalachian Kentucky, pull from bourbon, from Appalachian moonshine, but also we have like peated bourbon and yeah, you have a really interesting more, more scotchy things out yeah. there too yeah. in, our, in our lineup. Yeah. So we try to be not just doing what Kentucky is doing, but do something that's kind of broader and addresses the sort of uh, melting pot culture that New York City is. Can I ask you, was the moonshine that you bought, was it in a, a glass jug? So my wife's family <laughs> is from Tennessee or Alabama and Tennessee. <laughs> and when I go home yeah. at Thanksgiving, there's like a glass jug in the freezer and you just know, you don't know what proof right. it is. If you're brave and you want some, <laughs> you can have some. Is that, or how did you experience I mean, receiving moonshine? Definitely the mason jar was pretty ubiquitous. Mason jar, okay. But actually the plastic milk jug. Um, was also oh yeah, more uh, I've, I've seen the moonshiners show that they love putting it in a, in a plastic milk jug. And in that fact, is their preferred method of transportation. <laughs> <laughs> I guess they don't break, right? That's, that's yeah. Well, what they do is they leach chemicals out of the plastic. <laughs> oh wow! So that moonshine, mm. over the course of, and I hung on to the jug for you know sort of posterity, and by yeah, it, you know. It just, you know I don't know if I trust some of these moonshiners to cut their heads and tails very well. So the, the, the milk jug, the, 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 the chemicals the milk jug. This was everything. There was no heads, no tails. This was the whole, uh, the whole run went into this particular jug and it was there you go. pretty gnarly. But, and, and in fact, I will say when I started to distill, I wasn't necessarily out to make a high quality product. I was just out to make moonshine because that, that was the fun of it. But then, New York being a very culinary, um, fairly high, you know, the, holding people to a high standard if they're going to try and make something, they kind of pressed me on what would it make to, to, for this to taste good. And that led me down a path, which is that if, you're, if your white spirit or your moonshine or your white dog or your distillate, whatever you want to call that, if that is good, then everything else will follow. Because we intrinsically understand in the world of whiskey that, um, uh, age improves whiskey. But what are the other variables? That was something that was not being talked a lot about 10 years ago. So, um, so that was really the fundamental kind of starting point for all the, the, the entirety of the distillery. I've got a question too. Our founder, Fawn Weaver, I think is watching and she sent a comment that said, what took Colin from Kentucky to New York? What brought you to New York City? Oh man. Um, well, I went to college in the Northeast. I went to Yale, so I was close to New York upon graduation. Had no job, thought I might um, maybe do something in the movie business, um, but eventually worked in architecture. That was what I kind of settled on for a career, and this was really a, a total side hustle. Um, that it worked out well. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> good time. Uh, became m more interesting than architecture. So, um, so kind of yeah. eased into it. I mean, I, I kept my day job part-time for easily the first four years of, of starting the distillery. Um, but then, um, but then got into it and, um, yeah. And I guess because I was really interested in the culture of whiskey and the history of whiskey, um, that's what kind of got me into not just being a distiller, but also some of the, the book projects. So, Mm -hmm. uh, wrote this book, The Guide to Urban Moonshining, um, which was really kind of taking that home distiller experience and kind of saying, actually, this is maybe more accessible than the mythology around whiskey would have you believe um, that, in fact, you can at home with corn and yeast, you know, because you can make whiskey. It's not actually quite as mythological and you don't have to have a 
history of grandparents in Kentucky who know how to do it to be able to have that knowledge. Um, so that was the first book. And then the second book um, was called Dead Distillers. And that's how I first um, learned about Nearest Green because um, I wrote a chapter about Jack Daniel and, and uh, found him there. So there's some of that information in this book. And I, I found that whole story to be one of the most interesting of the whole book. I mean, it covers Jim Beam and the Baker's Mark family and Happy Van Winkle and a lot of the luminaries of, of distilling history. Um, but I spent a lot of time, especially on the Jack Daniel chapter, because I felt like um, that story was so compelling. And then when uh, Fawn came around and introduced the brand, um, I got very excited because I think it's, it's, it was just very intelligent to bring that story to a broader audience. Ian, I think you, since we're talking about distilling, I think you had a question about the process. Ian's got a bit of a background as a distiller, if you want to share as well. Um, but you have a distillery specific question that might be fun to share. Yeah, so um, uh, first, a lot of my questions that I was trying, I was trying to think of what I could ask you. And this came along with your bottles and man, is, is this- Oh yes. Uh, the brand primer is, is gorgeous. It Thank answered you. a lot of questions. I loved, I loved how transparent you are and how clear your message was. Uh, and at the end, when you kind of shout out to the other craft distillers who are making craft spirits, what it is mm -hmm. today, uh, mm -hmm. It was pretty poignant. So I used to work for Koval. Oh, great! Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah back in the day, so I was I was in there still uh, in the distillery for a bit. Um, so my my fun question is, what is because I have plenty. What is your scariest distillery moment? It can be <laughs> injury. It can be failed distillate. Uh -huh. <laughs> give, give it to me. <laughs> I mean, I'll share mine if you share yours. It'll be fine. <laughs> it's it's got to be when you were working that still in your kitchen back in the day. Yeah. Yeah. When you blew up your kitchen. Not, yeah. Fingers and ears. I've, I've never <laughs> experienced any uh, explosion. Uh, I, don't <laughs> <laughs> oh, I did, I did oh, melt my really countertop. Oh. <laughs> and so there was a question of like, would that impact the security deposit of that first apartment? <laughs> <laughs> um, but that was, that was sort of not us. I mean, that was, I gradually watched that happening and, and just didn't intervene. Um, I, you know, I would say Hurricane Sandy, I mean, if, as, as you know, we've been in it 10 years now, almost to the day actually. Um, and Hurricane Sandy was a pretty serious episode because our distillery flooded three feet on the factory floor. <clears throat> but that was not a, a scary moment in the sense of like an immediate crisis. One weird thing is we got some wine from a, um, and this was very recent history, we got some wine that we were gonna try and turn into brandy as like a very small side project. And it was absolutely, disgusting <laughs> i have always said like you just kind of if you make narrow cuts off the skill and you kind of you know you just if you're cautious about everything and that the distilling is not hard and there's no secrecy to it and you just kind of like approach everything from and it's just like none of that worked it was just inexplicably <laughs> disgusting and bad. We have no idea what happened. Brandy can go bad in a yeah. very special way. Mm -hmm. yeah. so there is something about it. Well, I think there might have been sulfur added to this wine, oh. which then oh, interacted yeah. with the, the something through the distillation. Anyway, it was, yeah. a, it was a full on disaster <laughs> and a waste of Colin, time. Colin, you, did you save the bottles and send them to people who, who give you bad reviews? <laughs> well, yeah. I'm, I'm just kidding. Brilliant. Whiskey. That would not whiskey whiskey is an industry of love only. <laughs> well, yeah. We, we have, there's a distillery across town that we kind of. <laughs> another Brooklyn distillery where we sometimes send products. No, um, actually, I, I even said, like, is that brandy still around for the hand sanitizer? Because, you know, <laughs> and that toad of terrible stuff for six months. Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah. Um, but if. Uh, you answered the question in the brand primer so perfectly, but I would I would love for everyone to hear it uh, about the inspiration behind creating Kings uh, Kings County Distillery, but also why whiskey? Because having been in that craft world, 
uh, and like and making your own stuff uh making whiskey can be quite the investment so i'm kind of curious what inspired you to, to to create kings county and also just why whiskey itself yeah i think i mean for me it really was taken from this idea that that moonshine was kind of looked down on and i sort of felt that that was um unfair and that that moonshine really was the basis of all great whiskey and so the idea that um that that this is something that's kind of whiskey connoisseurs look down on i felt in a way that that was ripe for reevaluation and so i kind of got into it from that point of view and probably would have been very happy to never make aged whiskey but then you start making the white whiskey and when you're a hobby distiller you don't really have the capacity to age whiskey but once you get into producing any amount of volume let's say you know when we started out we were doing you know five gallon barrels you can start to age the whiskey and then you start to go down this rabbit hole of well if i can age it for a year what about two years and then four years and so this summer we'll have our first seven-year-old whiskey come out oh wow wow and that's exciting and that is like a life you have project. my address you can send me a bottle <laughs> <laughs> um so to be able right to kind of devote your it is a thing that you can kind of devote your it's a life's work that really will take you your whole life to come up with that one in my case you know i'll, I'll be old by the time we have 20 year old whiskey and um you know and you don't even make every single barrel on the first day so it takes it's taken us 10 years to make a seven-year-old whiskey it will probably take us 15 to 20 years to make a 12-year-old whiskey so um you know that kind of romance of the aging process and just the marriage of the kind of agricultural side of whiskey making the corn the barley um with that sort of celebratory aspect of drinking culture which is to consecrate life's blessings and kind of celebrate um the good times and the bad times you know it kind of is this union of those two sides of human endeavor and for that reason and because it it takes corn and and reduces it in volume and then ages it for any number of years it just is this very perfect time consuming um very very challenging thing to make and that's what makes it so um if if you're very competitive and ambitious <laughs> like like i am <laughs> it is the thing that that sort of sits in front of you the whole time saying you know what you know wh what what would happen this four year is great but what about the seven year and the seven mm -hmm. years time what about the 12 year it just <laughs> it's a thing that's always ahead of you and nearly impossible to ever achieve and that's what makes it so fun for me i guess i would say cool yeah that's not from the primer that's off the cuff no that's, that's not <laughs> <laughs> what's up man we've talked a bit yeah, about your corn-based oh. whiskeys mm -hmm. uh but i think sailor had a question about a new category that's been created in new york specifically which is a grain that we don't uh, feature so much it's a flavoring grain mm -hmm. in uncle nearest um but sailor do you want to talk about ask your question about the empire rye yeah so um i live in washington state i call boston home but i'm originally a new yorker um and so when i when the whole empire rye grain started the whole designating um you know the the rye grain from new york it was so exciting to see that happen um and i think it was such a wonderful it's such a great um springboard um, for other states to do that. And I know that, you know, Washington has been working on um, being able to cultivate peat, you know, and, and specifically make it Washington peat. Thank you to Westland for that. Mm -hmm. um, so, but before I ask my question, so here I have a giant jug of brandy that was given to me <laughs> by a local distillery that had the same thing. This is disgusting. I don't know what to do with it. And I was like, I'll take it and I'll make bitters mm -hmm. out of it. And so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I have these right. things all over my house. <laughs> yeah. um, so two, it's twofold. So I am a huge proponent of white whiskey also, which is really strange because I, most of the whiskey that I drink and, and choose to purchase is very, very, very old, and I'm a scotch drinker as well, but right. um, 
white rye for me. It, there's a, something very special about mm -hmm. unaged rye that I'm mm -hmm. almost obsessed with, um, mm -hmm. finding beautiful white rye. And I think that, um, you know, when the Empire Rye Grain was, was given that designation and, and, you know, I think it was so great for that rye category to come back again. And that's something that I'm really excited to see happen in the U.S. How, what was that like for you guys being in New York, um, getting that, that designation to happen? Yeah, so um, I, sh well, <laughs> it's, I'm glad Nicole is watching because it was really her idea. <laughs> it, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I give credit to Nicole where it was due. So she had gone to a conference for, of craft distillers. Um, I believe it was in 2015 in Denver. And many of the New York distillers did well and came back with this idea of making rye according to a high rye, 75% New York grown, New York distilled rye whiskey. And I thought there wasn't enough that would really differentiate that. And so I was kind of like, yeah, maybe, I don't know if people will be into it, but make 20 barrels and you know, we'll see how it goes. And so then, you know, years passed, Nicole went to Telemordu and, and, and then uh, I guess it was around two years ago, it came time to open up some of the first barrels that had crossed the two year straight rye threshold. And my whole conception of the project changed when it came time <laughs> to release it because I finally understood what it was. And it wasn't really about differentiating New York rye from any other rye. It was just a mark of identity of provenance mm -hmm. that tells you where it's from. Mm -hmm. And in fact, Tennessee whiskey mm -hmm. is exactly the same thing. Mm -hmm. There's nothing that really differentiates Tennessee whiskey from, you know, bourbon. I mean, yes, there's the Lincoln County process and some distillers do that very heavily or do it very lightly. Um, you know, but so, you know, we have this 150 year old precedent in Tennessee whiskey and the fact that I didn't pick up on that <laughs> when it was time to make the first batch of Empire Rye, I certainly have picked up on it in the inter in the you know since we've released it, and so now we are producing much more of our Empire Rye. But it remains the whiskey that is in most demand and the whiskey that is hardest for us to keep in supply because our yield is much smaller with rye, mm -hmm. and um, it's it's only in you know the rye harvest is in October, which means that by the time you're getting it out to your accounts and stores it's almost Christmas and you've almost missed the rush season. So it's kind of funny in that way too. Um, but I do love white rye distillate. Um, it, it's, it's kind of rye is described as a spicy grain, but I would describe it more as a grassy grain when it comes to the, mm. to the distillate. And yes. so I Didn't would- the spiciness come from the yeast more so well, than- Well, see the that's, rye and, and, and Michael Veach has talked about this several times and I, we could go down this rabbit hole. I will, I will fight, I've gotten yes. into fights about this, <laughs> that the spice does not come from the damn grain, it comes from the yeast, because of course it's a grass and I have a beautiful bottle here of white rye. Um, I collect them. Uh, this uh -huh. one's from Southern Ohio. <laughs> Um, and they wow. use an Ohio rye. Uh, it's, I, I think that the beauty of it is, you know, again, different types of whiskey. You've got bourbon, you've got Tennessee whiskey. Now we have American single malts. The white category deserves love, my friends. Yes. Um, yes. Go out there and when you are, you know, go to your local distillery. It's, in, it's rye in specific too. And, and I don't know, you know, there's something about the rye just as it is without the barrel, I think can sometimes if it's delicate enough, it interrupts the flavor in my opinion. And that's what I, what I really love about the rye. So I think everybody needs to, to, to get out there and give it a try and, um, and I, I, uh, I would, I not poo-poo totally it. Second. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I would totally second that for all the people out there that are chasing these very expensive, hard to find bottles, you could put a bottle of unaged corn whiskey and unaged rye whiskey in front of them and they wouldn't necessarily be able to tell you which was which. Mm -hmm. And until you really get yourself trained and start to do that process of start with the basics, understand the grains, work your way, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, it's fun to try to drink old whiskeys. I'm not saying don't <laughs> drink old whiskeys. <laughs> the idea that you would then turn your back on something that is really the foundation of all these whiskeys, I find to be one of those fun things about whiskey culture that Especially if you're a vodka drinker. Um, I used to laugh my butt off. I would, uh, at a distillery I worked at formerly, I would have, um, 
you know, people come in and, oh, I don't drink whiskey. I just came for the tour because it was a beautiful farm. I'm like, oh, that's great. Here, I'm going to give you a little vodka to try. And, and I would ask them if they drink vodka, yes. And I would give them some of the white rye. And they're like, oh, this is wonderful vodka. It's so smooth. And I'm like, yeah, because it's <laughs> <laughs> But I'm glad it. you're enjoying love- it. Or people say, oh, I don't drink white dog. And I'm like, really? Mm-hmm. Do you drink gin or mm-hmm. vodka? Oh, yeah. You know, when I'm not drinking whiskey, great. Try this. You're going to like it. <laughs> <laughs> right, or silver tequila, which is a very flavor forward pot distilled, right. you know, white spirit that some, you know, m- many people perceive as yes. superior to its aged format. So, you know, it is, it's all cultural. And that's the thing to me, again, what, what got me interested in whiskey is to some extent that culture of it. And um, what's exciting about the craft distillers and Empire Rye specifically, but also American single malt from the Pacific Northwest or the sort of smoky barbecue Texas whiskeys Mm -hmm. is that we Mm -hmm. are developing a little bit of a regional, a map, a whiskey map of the United States that will someday rival the whiskey map of Scotland with its, its regions. And so it's been Kentucky and Tennessee for Mm -hmm. 50, Mm -hmm. hundred years, but now to have sort of geeky rye whiskeys from the Northeast and brewer led single malt whiskeys from the Northwest and these sort of smoky barrel forward Texas whiskeys, that's and, and, and Missouri and bourbon now too. <laughs> bourbon wow. from all but I think two or three states. Yeah, I don't think yeah. Hawaii has a bourbon. Yeah, yet. not the, yet. They're, they're working on it. They're gonna find a bill in Missouri. They're, they're Hawaii. Oh yes, Missouri, <laughs> Missouri bourbon. bourbon. Yes, no, yeah, I do know what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. actual Missouri. Yeah, like a like yeah. a yeah. The barrels exactly. have to come from Missouri. To yes, you have to get the, right. the wood from the Ozarks. That's right. the big thing for that. But we'll have the designation of the American single malt, and they'll be and I forget and I I don't know if they've said like the peat that now because before you could not cut peat and cultivate peat in the U.S. so you had to import it but now to have American peat so that's really going to define that American single malt category is what they want that to call it an American single malt it has to be American peat and like you said Texas balcones I mean what they're doing that dusty smoky bourbon is so amazing too it's just really exciting like you said all the different um, regions using terroir like we should mm-hmm. be again. Yeah. I think I'm going to have to direct the conversation to our Kentucky representative to defend the honor of Kentucky. Oh, after God. All this conversation. <laughs> uh, but Richie, you have a couple questions for Colin too, right? I, I do. But before I mean, I it's hard for a British accent to really defend Kentucky. <laughs> but <laughs> Wait, wait that's, that's called a muddled British accent? <clears throat> oh, okay. Yeah. I, you know, Colin, I live in Louisville. Um, the, the big city. I'm not sure if you ever went to the big city when you lived in <laughs> um, or whether you stayed out east. <laughs> but yeah, uh, but yeah. here in here in the big city, we uh we have uh, whiskey delivery services, which are awesome. So about ten minutes before we started this uh, <laughs> this Zoom, I ordered a bottle of Uncle Nearest. I wanted to order Kings County. I really did, Colin. I swear. But uh, they they didn't have any uh, to deliver, so I ordered a bottle. It's like it's like sending tacos to Mexico. <laughs> it said Bourbon, <laughs> Kentucky. It just you know. <laughs> it is. So about ten minutes before we started, I got on uh, an app called Drizzly. I ordered a bottle of Uncle Nearest 1856, and then a, a few minutes ago, when Zoom rudely cut me off, <laughs> the guy was at the door delivering my whiskey. So here it is, y'all. <laughs> here is proof that you can still get. Your uncle nearest delivered to your door, even when we're on Shameless. quarantine. And to be fair, I got my Kings County on Drizzly too. So in states that carry Kings County, you can get it online as well. Absolutely. Yes. So, um, so Colin, I-, I wanted to share a little story with you real quick about, about some Eastern Kentucky. So I'm not sure if you've heard this story before. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. uh, so I'm, I'm buddies with, uh, with, with Trey Zell. I'm sure you're, you're pretty yeah, friends yeah. with me too. And, uh, and I met his dad one day, Chet, and, uh, and his dad told me a story that I wasn't 100% sure that it was true when he was telling me, but then I got online and Googled it, and apparently it is. Um, he, Chet told me that his grandmother lived in Eastern Kentucky, was a bootlegging moonshiner, and she was the first person in the state of Kentucky in history to get arrested for moonshining. And I was like, sounds kind of like a tall tale, but apparently it's true. It's, uh-huh. it's out there on, on the internet. And so Chet told me that that was what really got him interested in researching because he then went to the Filson uh, Society. Uh-huh. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. 
found it was true, uh, did more research, and, and now Chet has two books, and him and his uh, son started a, a, an amazing whiskey distillery here in Kentucky, and it all came because of his grandmother being the first Eastern Kentucky person to be arrested. So. Yes. I mean, when you're a Kentucky person, the difference between Bluegrass Kentucky and Appalachia Kentucky is a huge deal. But you have to understand Kentucky is, they are both two sides of the same coin and two versions of the same personality. So uh, I'm, I'm always um, constantly aware of that sort of cultural divide in Kentucky, even though once you go to a place like New York or Chicago or Los Angeles, people are sort of like, Kentucky, isn't that all? You know, Kentucky fried yeah. chicken and. like big city anymore. I'm like, what is this village I'm living right. in when I go right. to New York? Right. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, I, I lived a little... summer in Louisville, and it's a, it's now that I have uh, that you know now that I've lived in New York for so long, Louisville feels like a very nice mix of the sort of Kentucky the the parts of Kentucky that I really love, which um, which are shoes that you don't really get in New York, but they're a sort of family and um, nature and and sort of things that you know you just you lose when you're in a very big city. Um, yeah. but you also have great cultural institutions and, um, you do it, it for folks like, like us who, who are in the whiskey industry this is like the Hollywood Hills of the whiskey industry I mean <laughs> exactly. you can go out to a bar in Louisville <laughs> yes. and, and like, it's, it's true from the whiskey industry you can just walk in at any moment and just be like oh, <laughs> right <hey."> yeah. <laughs> like, great to see yes. yeah yeah it's, it's a beautiful thing but anyway I, have, so my, I, my I routinely run into people in bars in Louisville that are you know peers mm -hmm. or yeah. colleagues or 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 you know. it's, it's, it's a beautiful place to live. Um, so, so here's my question for you. We, and Ian kind of touched on it a little bit, but um, I wanted to know, because we're, we're building a, a whiskey company every day and we're mm -hmm. building a distillery every day. So, so we have a lot of moments where we have these kind of just like really, really good, feel good moments where we think, wow, this is amazing. Just look around at what we're doing. And, and it just kind of like makes you just feel really good. And, and, and then we think, man, it can't get any better than this. <laughs> and, then we, and then we have more moments that come after that because our brand has grown so fast. And we think, wow, this is now the best moment ever. So I want to know at this point in Kings County, what is the most like amazingly jubilant moment you've had? And also maybe the most disappointing moment you've had? Well, I, I will say a fairly jubilant moment happened a week and a half ago when you know we had basically ceased operations we shut down our bar we had to essentially lay off our bartenders and uh tour guides and all of our visitor staff and then we released a hand sanitizer that is you know <laughs> sold out um within four hours and that was people who i think really wanted the business to stick around and were willing to kind of find a way to make that happen. So that was a really dramatically meaningful moment for our business where you have a lot of people who are still kind of commuting, you know, going into the distillery. We have, everything is now sort of wardened off where we have two people in different zones and I think we're doing it very safely, but it's still, you know, being in the streets of New York still feels kind of like a war zone. So um, to have that moment where people were, we could tell that people were gonna support us really felt uh, profoundly meaningful and that was very not long ago so I will count that as the the best moment um, you know there haven't been a lot of bad moments I mean there have been like minor bad moments but I, I think um, really the joy that I find and the thing that keeps me going I mean it's that's we've been in business for 10 years and there's not um, you know, it, we live in a startup culture that sort of churns over businesses quickly and, and the thing that you, you know, the, the internet company that you thought was gonna exist day to day becomes something else and, and the way that we live our lives changes very drastically. And one thing that I love about whiskey is that it, it really is, it doesn't change very fast. And so to, be, to have been around for 10 years and to be able to sort of mark that occasion, even during this bizarre moment, um, and to, and to have that sort of lifeline being thrown to us f from being able to distribute this sanitizer, um, that, that has certainly been the best moment so far. Um, I am quite certain that when we finally release that seven year old whiskey, that will feel like a pretty big achievement. 
Um, don't, and one don't, that... don't let me have whiskey FOMO on that seven year old. Yeah, <laughs> I can Wait, definitely, yeah. definitely go buy some of that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, seven years is not even like a very long time in the world of American whiskey, but it feels very hard fought on our, you know, for me. Um, so, yeah, I, I mean, you, you know, the tough things are, uh, and you know, when we get together with other distillers, it's like talking about equipment and things break and things, you know, don't go the way they're supposed to go. Um, but none of that ever compares to the, the, the satisfaction of, of making something truly great and sharing it with people and having them not, and especially when it comes to things like awards, like the San Francisco World Spirit competition, I think is kind of a joke amongst uh, bartenders and, and retailers because they're like, oh yeah, everybody wins an award. But you think about it, that's a room of people who are journalists they are uh, professionals in the spirits industry on the distributor level. They're bartenders. They're people who work with spirits every day and they have no idea what's in front of them. So if you have a room of people like that who can pull your product out and say, this is a double gold winner, that is an amazing, an amazing <clears throat> moment because it's so, uh, it's so genuine. And so I do feel particularly gratified in, in those instances of awards. And I look for other people that win those awards too, because that meant that all those same people that liked my whiskey also liked this whiskey. And I, I do think, you know, you get to the commercial side of our business where, um, you know, there's the three tier system and the complexities of negotiating all of that. And it's very easy to sort of lose sight of that idea that ultimately it is about this sort of beautiful thing that we all make. And, to get in a room with people who appreciate that and to pull it out of a lineup, that's really special. So, you know, somewhere in that realm of, uh, of joy is, is where I am right now, I guess I would say. Yeah, nice. well, that's great. And, and I know that everyone really appreciates what you're doing uh, by making hand sanitizer and, and supplying <laughs> yes. it to people who really need it. It's, it's, <laughs> to be sure, to be sure, when great. this is all over, we're not gonna keep making sanitizer. <laughs> <laughs> so, get it while you can. <laughs> yeah. All right, so I got one silly question for you too, because I, I follow you on social media, and for some reason I, I I couldn't see it on your social. I couldn't find it, but for some reason I remember a long time ago, I thought you posted a picture of your first car you oh, ever yes. bought. Yeah, I, I, I tried to find it on social media, and I couldn't, but I had it in the back of my mind, and so I want you to let everyone know. Uh, what was your first car you ever had and now what you drive now? <laughs> yes. So I, uh, I, I grew up with not a lot of means and my parents were like, like, you're never getting a car, forget it. Um, and so uh, I, and then I moved to New York and you don't need a car in New York. So I really never had a car until somebody was listening to an NPR program about the distillery. And I mentioned the fact that we didn't have any delivery vehicle. And she's like, I have a 1991 stick shift, uh, you know, baby blue Geo Metro. <laughs> Do you want this car to make deliveries? And it just so happened that that was the car that I learned to drive on, like make and model. And I was sort of like, um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, what, what, um, what, did, what did you name her? Lisa, after the, the <laughs> wonderful uh, woman who gave us that car. A beautiful ode. <laughs> she, uh, she still exists. She doesn't quite run right now, um, but she's sitting in front of the distillery. And as soon as this is... <laughs> Uh, hey, you know what? When I come out there, we're, we're going to take Lisa for a spin when I get when I get myself out there. Yeah, I mean, we're going to go make some deliveries of Lisa. <laughs> the number of yeah, I mean, the number of bottles of Kings County whiskey that have moved through that vehicle. It is the ultimate moonshine hot rod <laughs> in existence. A <laughs> um, little less on the hot part of the hot. <laughs> rod, but, well, well um, I'll I'll raise my my glass to to Lisa. Yeah. Job well yeah. done. Job well done. Now. She is a, before, she's a good car. And I, I'm, I'm in this moment yeah. where it's like really past her time, but she's been around for <laughs> 20, <laughs> 28 years. So uh, she's fine. 
She is yeah. mine. I have to keep her. As long her. as she's still running, she's a, gotta keep her. She's a gold She does not run. She just oh, oh, exactly. a, <laughs> Well, you have like a museum, right? There's yeah, a museum. Poor car. Right, right. I, we were thinking about maybe like putting it in the, the, the sort of outdoor patio of the tasting <laughs> room and people can kind of like go get selfies with the old car. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> I suppose that might be a thing like um, afterlife for her. <laughs> Before I uh, pass the last question on to Matt Neal in London, we have a couple questions from uh, people that are watching at home. Mm -hmm. um, one of them is from Rhonda, who wanted to know uh, about the categories of rye and how Empire rye differs from other American ryes. Uh, if you could talk yeah. about that. And then from Fawn, I'll just get them both in while I can. Uh, she wants to know if there's anything we can do to help Kings County or your community at this time or what uh, people watching might be able to do other than order your whiskey, which is probably the, the best thing to do at the moment, right? Yeah, right. Um, well, okay, so I'll, I'll tackle the rye question. Rye is, um, uh, many people don't necessarily realize that, that rye really died in the United States. And certainly there were brands like Overholt that were Pennsylvania brands that then got absorbed into sort of conglomerate distilleries and now most of the rye that's sold is made in Kentucky or Indiana. Um, so really that idea of Kentucky bourbon and Tennessee whiskey, there was always Pennsylvania rye and New York rye and Maryland rye, but none of those industries survived through prohibition and then through the industry consolidation that happened. So there were historically like a, a Monongahela, like a Pittsburgh style rye, and Maryland rye, which people I think might have been a higher corn content, whereas the Pittsburgh version might have been a higher rye content. Um, our Empire New York rye tends to be more on the higher rye content side of it. But, uh, and, and then commercial rye that usually has a high corn content because rye is more expensive and harder to work with for distillers. It can gum up your equipment, Quite. it can foam up and be you know, it's, as a distiller, I hate it. <laughs> so, uh, so for, you know, for many reasons, rye kind of died out with, um, with, with just the changes in the industry. But a lot of bartenders and the craft cocktail movement certainly discovered a lot of historical recipes that called for rye when rye was, I think I read once that in, it was around 1870 that bourbon surpassed rye in popularity. So before that moment, the Civil War and before, rye was the dominant spirit. After that moment, bourbon was the popular spirit. So many craft distillers have tried to sort of resuscitate these, these different styles of whiskey and interpret what those historical styles might have meant. Um, but there really is no official guidelines. So, uh, you know, at this point, Empire Rye, you know at least that it's a New York rye that's made from 75% rye. Um, but what determines a Maryland rye or a Pennsylvania rye, there's no particular legal framework. Um, they're just- It's all in tradition. Yeah, mm -hmm. they're just geographical yeah. designations mm -hmm. that are based on tradition. Mm -hmm. I can't so, say that Maryland rye does have more corn. That is, that is their tradition is that it has more corn. Right. And if you want to talk about the differences of rye regionally, rye grow in different regions as they have different flavors. So like the Midwest rye sure. tend to be more minty. Mm -hmm. um, Interesting. And then mm -hmm. based on what yeast you use, and Colin, you can speak to this better than I can, what yeast you use will also bring out different flavor compounds within a rye. So certain yeast will make a rye peppery and spicy. Mm -hmm. um, because one, one of Rhonda's questions was, what's the different flavor profiles between the ryes? And it's like... It's a huge... We, we, we don't have that kind of time. It, no, that's not like, and that's why I put links in there. It's a huge question. Um, a great question. And... Uh, yeah. In the Ohio Valley, let's say rye is very sweet there, and, and we have a long tradition in the Ohio Valley, just like with Pennsylvania, of growing and distilling rye. Um, so yeah, it, it's I, I put some resources there, Rhonda, that hopefully will help you because that's a rabbit hole that would take, oh, that could take hours. <laughs> Interesting yeah, right. rabbit hole, but it could take hours. But I would I would argue that the your craft distiller tends to to make a product that's probably more loyal to the history of rye whiskey. Mm -hmm. So people like Dad's Hat, uh, Wiggle, um, Hudson, Kings County, you know, we're, we're smaller distillers that are doing it um, more like it had been done in the early days. But that sort of leads me to my response to your next question, which is just like, what can you do? Um, you know, I think this is, if, if 
you have a craft distiller that is local to you by there. I mean, everybody's drinking more. So, <laughs> what? so, no, so no. we've got that worked I, out. I'm, I'm not. <laughs> or more yeah. at home, let's say, yeah, sure, rather sure. than out. I think, I think that's the misconception because I, I, I'm not a fan of that statement. Okay, I think okay, it's good, that, good. right? Yeah. So Correctly, that has a fine. that has a terrible connotation, I think. Um, just like saying, you know, <laughs> um, you're addicted yeah. to things. So it's, really it's that we have to purchase our own bottles as opposed to grabbing a beer with a friend or having a dram out with a friend, having wine or cocktails with dinner, because we right. know that well, Americans drink and eat out more than ever before and more than most any other country right. in the world. And so every drink at home is at the expense of a drink that probably most of us would have had out and that yeah. right. Have employed yes. so i think the balance i think it's balanced yes. sailor sailor there was some nielsen data released this morning and if you read it yeah. you will be shocked at what's yeah. going on in america right now no it's i don't believe it wild. i think we were drinking this i think we were drinking the same it's just that we're doing it at home that's what i think you should, some of the data for me the england as well is pretty oh, astounding it's wild yeah. well your punters are are nuts anyway the amount of stuff you guys drink <laughs> <laughs> but I guess I would say the Jack Daniels of the world and the and the Diageos and the um, you know there there are large spirits companies that will weather the storm very easily, mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. and there are a lot of startup businesses uh, uh, that that could use a, um, a, a you know just they could use your business. That's it. Mm -hmm. It's just we're we're all voting with the way that we spend our money for the kind of world that we want to return to, and I think the more you can. And uh, I mean, there is a debate on whether you should go to get takeout at the restaurant or not. But yeah, I think you should go to the restaurant. You know, you should you should spend your money in ways that will will describe the world that you want to exist that is after this all ends. And so that means going to your craft distiller and figuring out how you can support them, whether it's buying their whiskey, if they're making sanitizer, go ahead. You know, that's a great way. Um, but you know, all of us want to get back to normal business of making whiskey, for sure. <laughs> We've had some fun with the sanitizer. It's it's kind of a legal ch challenge and doing it in a way that's you know meets all the criteria from the TTB and the WHO and the CDC. You know, that's sort of fun to get into. But most of all, we like making whiskey. So um, getting back to that will be. Uh, and hopefully you will all receive the proper tax incentives as well for doing oh it. Oh my God, yes. Yeah. I've been on, I've been on those, for... those watching those web lives things and I'm, I'm right there with you guys, supporting you guys because I come from the craft, I come yeah. from the craft world. So I'm, I'm on that yeah. fight with you guys and I'm behind you and every just, American I, should understand that. Just to explain that, that that's, that's that beverage alcohol makers that are selling sanitizer have to pay full excise tax as though we sold it as a beverage when we're selling it as a, Sanitizer and our sanitizer is eighty three percent alcohol, and our whiskey, our moonshine is forty percent alcohol. So that means literally the double the cost of our product that we sell for, you know, our moonshine is a twenty dollar, two hundred ml bottle. To sell it as sanitizer, we say give us a dollar, but it's twice the alcohol that's in our twenty dollar wow. bottle. So um, to to cut to have to cover that excise tax is a burden that's being needlessly asked into stores right now. And I think it will go through that it will change because I think there are so many advocates yes. um, now of craft distillers within the right level of government, but um, it's, a good, it's a good thing to bring up for sure. Matt and London, do you want to finish this off with one last question? Absolutely. Um, you mentioned that you um, took some inspiration from Scotch. So mm -hmm. I was just wondering if you had any standout non-US um, uh, whiskeys that uh, that you, you're drinking at the moment? Mm, that is, that <laughs> is, uh... Posh Matt, he's a, he's a patriarch. He's a patriot. <laughs> that's it, that's it. He's first American. Um, <laughs> uh, failing that, I was- Yeah, was well. The, uh... <laughs> <laughs> failing that, the other him. part Good of the job. question I had was what bar would you um, first go back into when the, um, the whole shutdown's lifted? Oh, please be somewhere in Eastern Kentucky. That's what I'm... And, and it can't be your own bar. <laughs> right, right, right. Uh, local karaoke local. joint in Eastern Kentucky. 
<laughs> not i mean in my in my hometown there's no bars because it's dry county so oh god yeah um yeah i might just get a bottle of something and get around a campfire which is which is very eastern kentucky style um i mean i will say i don't i don't want to prejudice myself by by talking too much about particular scotch uh brands because i know so, much less about scotch whiskey than i do about american whiskey um so you know i don't want to tip my hat necessarily um too far in that direction but i guess i would say you know th the place that i will go is not um it's not a whiskey bar it's not a cocktail bar it's a neighborhood bar and i think that these the the place that services your neighborhood is the place that is is the place for you and um you know there's so many places that are devoted to different formats of, of delivery of alcohol but um and and the cocktail world has sort of embraced all of these different sort of uh genres and 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 ideas but really you know the, the neighborhood bar there's a place in brooklyn called travel bar um you know that's that's the that's the place that i think people um will derive so much pleasure coming back to because it's the thing that we've been missing for so long um so it's maybe less of the formal experience of the uh, the occasional place that you go to for a special opportunity which is the the your standard local neighborhood bar whether it's a dive bar whether it's a whether it is a cocktail bar i mean that's you know there's there, <laughs> we have some very nice <laughs> neighborhood bars in brooklyn so um uh i want i, I don't again i don't want to call anybody out because it might be any number of wonderful places that i'll show up at but um, <laughs> but yeah fair enough that's a non-answer but uh, <laughs> no, it's, it's, it works. It's, it's, it's very diplomatic mm -hmm. <laughs> Well, Colin, we really appreciate you taking the time to chat with us today. Um, we always close with the whiskey fact and then with the toast. Um, so our whiskey facts for today, uh, Uncle Nearest obviously is named for the first African-American master distiller on record, um, which you can read about in Colin's book, Dead Distillers, uh, but also in the Jack Daniels biography by Ben Lee, is that his name? Ben Green. Ben, ben Green. Green, but yeah. not related to Nearest, uh, which has a new forward by our founder, Fawn Weaver. Oh, that's um, right. And uh, also a first uh, is that Kings County is the first uh, legal, legal distillery uh, in New York City since Prohibition. Mm -hmm. So if you're joining us uh, online or uh, if you're one of the panelists, if you want to grab a whiskey, I'm grabbing uh, next week's guest whiskey. Speaking of small, independent, local brands, um, we're going to talk to uh, Trent Tilton from San Diego Distillery next week. So join us next week. Um, at eight o'clock Eastern, or if you're out on the West Coast, like Trent and I are, uh, and Sailor as well, uh, 5 p.m. Um, so here's to, uh, here's to all the people on the front lines, here's to the people who are essential workers, to the first responders, to those uh, people making um, meals and restaurants still for takeout, for everybody who's a street cleaner, for FedEx delivery drivers, for Amazon drivers, uh, for all those people who are working when we are drinking whiskey, I say thank you and cheers to you. Cheers. And cheers. Matt, I'll, I'll, I'll raise an extra little cheers to, it is our beautiful producer Sailor's birthday today. Yes! So happy yes, birthday. thank you for reminding me. <laughs> all of <laughs> Sailor's birthday, <laughs> Richie. Love it's that. a blast to, to you too as well. Thank and, you. And you know, one last thing before we leave too, I know Fawn, uh, Weaver sent in a question earlier asking, what can we do to help Kings County? I think I figured out the answer. We can send a mechanic out there to go fix Lisa. <laughs> yes. Oh my God. <laughs> that would be, we can go that for would... a spin with Colin and Lisa. <laughs> yeah, that would, that would blow my, <laughs> blow my world. <laughs> right, in New York City. Yeah. <laughs> and cheers, a, a little extra cheers. Uh, my dad and I shared a birthday. Uh, he passed away a few years ago, so I always shout out to him. He was a big whiskey fan and a cheers. really cool guy. He was a talented uh, actual professional chef and then retired from that and went on to be a carbon doctor. Um, for indie race teams and created uh, oh. built race car and designed race car composites and mm -hmm. uh, was on many winning teams for Budweiser and Patron and he was just a super oh. cool guy so cheers oh, dad cheers, cheers to him cheers to dad. everyone
Thank you so much for being with us. And thank you, everybody that tuned in. This was Whiskey Wednesday with Uncle Nearest. Uh, again, you can find us tomorrow, same time, same place. On Thursdays, you can join the Cocktail Club as well, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard. And on Fridays, it's our happy hour. Again, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard. These are our live uh, shows that you can join us in. But we have something for you every night of the week. And coming soon is our own Ambassador YouTube channel. So until then, follow us all over the place um, on Uncle Nearest channels, Uncle Nearest Facebook and Instagram, and you can find us all individually as well. So thank you so much. Thank, thank you, Taylor. Thank you, Pat. Uh, yeah. Be well.